Hi, I'm Drexel Seymour. In 2021, I wrote my first book called Rise Up and Take Your Position, where I encourage individuals to you know, pursue their talent, um, cultivate it, and just rise up and take their position, whatever their purpose is in life. And now I am the author of a second book. It's called Seceding in Your Position. In fact, this is a sequel to the first book. I know that I told you to, you know, to rise up and take your position the first book. But even with that, you could, you could take your position, but you may end up failing. So this book is to provide you with 10 steps on how to succeed in your position. And no matter what position you are in, whether you are a politician, whether you are a pastor, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you are a student, no matter what position you are in, these 10 steps, I think, are applicable to you. And I encourage you to, to get the book, which is available on, on, on Amazon, and of course, in our local bookstore in Turks and Caicos, Panicas Bookstore. And this book could transform your life. This book will make you know how to become successful in anything you do. So thank you in advance for purchasing this book. Hey Turks and Caicos, it's Delano Williams here, your first Olympian. In order for me to succeed, I stay in my lane. I have my three Ds, discipline, determination, and dedication, and putting God first. This is what I do to stay in my lane. Also, I went to the World Junior Championship in Barcelona, Spain. What I had is tunnel vision. I ensure that I'm focused on myself, and ensure that I do things and prepare myself for what is to come. I know that I have trained hard. I know that I've put in months weeks of training. Discipline, what I mean by discipline, you have to be dedicated to what you want in life in order to be successful. I was determined in order to get my goals and my vision, what I want to happen in terms of me being a professional athlete. I also was disciplined enough to ensure that I put in the work day in and day out. Also, when it comes to going on the track and also off the track, I think track and field has helped me to be a better man and to be a better person. And what I want to do is to give back to my nation, Turks and Caicos Islands, in that capacity. Thank you. My name is Galmo Gilly Williams. Uh, everybody knows me as uh, Gilly. I'm a very good friend of Drex for many, many years. He's uh, one young man. I call him young because I think I have a few years on him. I know I have a few years on him, and I can see through my gray hair, and he's not there yet. Drex is one of the young men I always admire for his dedication of service, commitment to advancing Turkskay's Island and Turkskay's Islanders. Over the years, a lot of us may have read his columns and listened to his program uh, he, he has been running and doing for years. And for that, I want to say uh, a salute to Drex. And it's a demonstration of uh, when you have confidence of doing something. And uh, I think first, uh, if you believe in something, study it. And then once you really believe in it and you study it, then you'll, be feel, you'll feel so proud talking about it, writing about it, preaching about it, walking about it. And the more and more I think about growing up in North Caicos, our parents, they had confidence in raising a family. They went beyond the norm, whether our father were farmers or, or divers or whatever. They went out on the bank having confidence that they would make a catch to feed their family. And our mothers at home, they went in the field and they had confidence that our fathers would bring something back on the boat uh, for us to appear. They had confidence that they would invest in us in education, that we would be in productive citizens, which a lot of us are today. So I really want to as I say, salute Drex for all the work he has done over the years. And I want to encourage uh, Turks and Caicos Islanders in particular, uh, but everyone in general. Uh, over 40 years, almost 40 years ago, uh, when we started business, I really had, I had confidence. I was no doubt in anything about that uh, we would have made, or I would have made the business work. And I've, even in the darkest days, even with uh, 
And in the darkest days when things were rough and things were, seems to be impossible, I always have confidence that we would have overcome it. And even today with a growing society, growing providentialities from 40 years ago, uh, and it's challenging times now, things have changed. But I do have confidence that, uh, that the better days are ahead. And uh, I think also having confidence is having strong faith because if having faith is basically talk about seeing and believing and confidence is, is, is basically if you believe something and you go about it, you will make it. So I want to encourage uh, anyone to decide what you want to do, believe in it, talk about it from your heart and uh, walk it in your daily tasks. Strong confidence. We've been asked by Drax to give to speak on the issue of integrity and honesty as one of his tips for succeeding in your position. I can say you know, from that perspective, I'd say to anyone you want to live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you are buying a product, uh, getting service from someone, you want the person that's that you're engaging in, that salesperson, that person that's working for you to always be honest and to provide you with truthful and accurate information. Honesty and integrity go hand, hand in hand. And if you want to succeed, you have to understand that at the same bridge that took you over is the same bridge that you're going to come back over. One of the easiest ways to burn a bridge is for someone to find that you've been dishonest with them or that you lack integrity. And so we want to encourage you as you elevate and as you uh, succeed in your position and elevate in your position that you always try to be honest and exercise the greatest integrity. And once you do that, once you be honest, you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't cheat. You be fair with everyone. You treat everyone like how you want them to treat you and you'll be successful and pleasing in God's sight. So good day. I get the joy to sit down and sit and discuss how constructive criticism can be used in a really good way and how I think it's affected where I've been able to bring my business and I hope it's something that you find useful to sit and listen to for the next five to ten minutes. I tried to think about how I look at constructive criticism and the way I, I quickly thought of it, it's like you use it in the way that you wish. It's like me giving you a rope. You decide what you want to do with that rope. You can hang yourself with it, you can tie your own hands with it, you can tie yourself so you can't get very far because you've let it bother you, or you can use it to pull yourself up. And I choose to use it to pull myself up. Uh, you, have to, you have to look at constructive criticism as a tool, not as something where someone's trying to bring you down. How you perceive it is how you use it. If somebody gives you that and you perceive it in a negative way, and you're using it and you're getting offended by it, it's not going to be a useful tool for you. You have to understand, I'm a, probably the guy that appreciates it the most because I'm the guy that sometimes gives it the least. I'm always trying to be kind. I'm always trying to, if I go to a restaurant and I really didn't quite like my meal, I just quietly pay it and go away. So because I have that attitude, maybe I look at constructive criticism that's not given in a mean way, but truly given in a, in a way that someone's trying to help me. I look at it like a gift. And if you look at it like a gift, you receive it in the right way, you know? We're not, someone's not giving you something to make your day bad. If they're kind enough to go out of their way and give you some feedback, some honest feedback about your product, thank them. And thank them and receive it as a gift. One thing that I know is seek it out. So many times people avoid it. Like they almost don't want to ask, how was your thing? Because you're thinking, what if they say something bad? If you're feeling that way, maybe there's a real reason behind your concern. Maybe deep down in your heart, you're not really giving 100% to your product. Maybe you're not really wanting to know whether you're doing what you're doing the best way you can. Sometimes it's not even about the way that you're delivering your product, but when you seek out constructive criticism, you'll be surprised some of the alternatives that people might say to you 
that you realize now you can expand that in your offering, expand it in your business, present something in a different way. And sometimes it's not just about redoing the way you're doing some exact product, but what people may see you do something well, give you some constructive criticism and say, by the way, I would have also done this with you. So seek it out, don't hide from it. What I can say is that without constructive criticism and without you being open to it, you become your own customer you, and you aren't your own customer. If you try to run your business and run what your offering is based only on your preferences, you've missed what the whole world may want. You are not your customer, you are the provider of the service to your customer and remember that. There's only one way to get that and that's to keep your ears open and this closed. <laughs> The more you do that, the more you, you take in and how you'll start amending your product to do it. With constructive criticism, I can tell you, if you use it wisely and your competitor doesn't, you're going to be the winner. If you let that happen the other way around where your competition is listening to constructive criticism and they're using it in a wise way and you're avoiding it at all costs, I can only tell you where you're probably going to be next to your competitor in the years to come. So. That's my little take on constructive criticism. Receive it in a positive way and it'll be used in a positive way. And I wish you luck in whatever ventures and things that you're taking on. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Ellery James, Managing Director of LaPelle's Group of Companies. Working hard. Nothing in life comes easily. Everything always requires a sacrifice. I recall when I first started my first business, it failed. It failed not because of we didn't work hard enough. It, was, it failed because of the discipline that was needed to see us through. After the failure of that company, we moved on to do the exact same thing, learning from the lessons that caused us to fall short the first time. Those lessons, along with the discipline, has delivered the level of success that we receive today. I recall opening, opening up our second store, and I, I recall facing the challenges and, and making the sacrifices, I recall evenings when all my friends would go out having cocktails or go to a party or so I would have to stay to the store to, pro to, to produce dry cleaning garments for, for restaurants and, and hotels. So that means that when restaurants would finish at six or seven o'clock in the evening and they would need their linens for the next morning, I would have to pick them up by 10 to have them ready by one o'clock in the morning so that they can have breakfast for six and seven o'clock. This went on for a few years. Even in the laundry, in the hotel industry, I remember picking up linens from 10 o'clock in 10 o'clock in the evening and processing them all night to have them back to the hotel by five o'clock in the morning. Not to mention that by eight o'clock, the dry cleaning would be open again. These are the type of sacrifices that has to be made when we're talking about trying to achieve your goals. Nothing in life comes easily. Sometimes, even when we face challenges, those challenges are not there to derail us. Those challenges are there to refine us, to strengthen us. For me, I find, <clears throat> I find, I find that, that my challenges in life has brought me to a place where I find strength strength to be able to move on to something new, strength to be able to achieve the unachievable. I personally start my day every day at 5.30, wake up with a prayer, go to exercise for 30 to 40 minutes, and by 6, 6.30, I'm somewhere at work. My day goes from 6.30 till approximately 7, 7.30 every evening. But one of the good things about working hard and working for yourself is once you find passion, it never feels like work. So you can actually do it every day. And I tell people, I do what I do because I love it. I don't do it for the money. The money is just a byproduct. So when it comes to working hard, the easiest way to not feel that you're working hard is to work in your passion. Work in something that you enjoy doing. 
Me personally, I've never worked a day in my life. And because I've never worked a day in my life, I totally enjoy every single thing I do. From garment processing, to the laundromat industry, to ensure that the car washes are working properly, to the construction and overseeing our projects and stuff, I truly enjoy it. So therefore, it's not really a burden. Yes, to be honest, at times, my flesh becomes weak, and yes, I, I do get tired. But those times, I pull away for a short, for a short period to regroup, and then I'm back again. My, re my recovery period, only, need, only I need five hours, five to six hours of dying time. Every now and then, you take a trip to yourself just to recover, and then you, you're back at it because the vision and the dreams are so big. There's so much to achieve and only we're here for a short period of time. I saw a TikToker that says, we only have 75 winters, 75 summers, 75 springs, 75 falls. I have already probably passed more than a third of that. I cannot afford to waste any more of my 75 summers. I truly want to enjoy life. I want the best things out of life. And I enjoy giving service. I enjoy providing a service that's valuable to, to the community, val valuable to the people that support it. And that too gives me a level of joy. So working hard comes easily for me because I've been doing it a long time ago. Not only that, it's important for us to instill these values in our kids. Because I remember years ago, before my dad passed, he told both my brother and I, say, it doesn't matter what you be in life, but you must be the best at it. And he even went down saying, hey, I don't even care if you pick up garbage, but you must be the best garbage collector in your community, in your area, and in your country. And with that, I use that same goal and that same task to to, to achieve success in almost anything I do, simply because I must be the best at it. There is no second option. There is no second place. So if my competitors, which I don't think I have any because I'm in my lane, but if my competitors sleep at five, then I'm, 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 I'm not gonna sleep till nine, simply because I need that edge. And I think that drives me to wanting to, to not only want to be the best, but then that gives me more time in the game to deliver the best. Of course, there are shortcomings, there are shortfalls. Sometimes we don't make the mark all that time, all the time. But it's important that we regroup and we, we go back again. Failure is never an option. Failure is always a lesson. And once you learn the lesson, you, you don't feel the sting of what you did not achieve. In order to, to, to be able to remain strong, your faith also must be intact. You know, being grateful, having an attitude of gratitude. Um, these things are, are some of the characteristics that I use. I'm using certain laws, like the law of attraction. I truly believe in it, and I've seen it manifest several times in my life, and th stuff that I've done. And I use the law of attraction to, to bring forth almost anything and everything that I want to see happen in my life. So having an attitude of gratitude, being gracious and being also acknowledging the Heavenly Father who, who's, all, who's given us strength to be able to, to do all of this stuff. Um, that with a positive attitude, I mean, I see no reason why we can't work and achieve our goals. Effective communication is important to success because leaders who build a culture of positive communication can help a business reach its goals with greater efficiency, produce satisfied workers, and improve brand identity, all of which translates to their own success. Nearly every job posting contains the words strong communication skills or effective communication skills. Good communication improves clarity in the exchange of concepts, knowledge, and ideas while reducing doubt or misunderstanding. It affects businesses in a number of ways. For example, knowing how to communicate in the right manner to the right audience in a company can help create a more cohesive workforce. Communicating honestly and transparently can also foster a sense of trust and positivity, which increases work satisfaction and improves morale. Additionally, creating a culture of strong communication 
helps improve the exchange of ideas, leading to increased creativity and innovation. Good communication can make the difference between confident, motivated employees and an unproductive team with low morale. It builds thriving relationships and gives people the information they need to contribute to the success of the business. Some experts say that the best managed companies are almost always the ones with the best communication flow. Some communications should always be held in person. Emails can be great, but when miscommunication happens, it can take multiple exchanges to sort out, and the risk of upset feelings and confusion are much greater. In those situations, make a phone call. People often forget that the phone is still an option. We can foster good, constructive communication by modeling these five communication skills known as the five C's of effective communication. One, be clear. To communicate effectively, you have to know what you want and take ownership for your own needs. Before communicating an issue, identify it, know what you want and need from the other person. Be as clear and objective as possible. Two, be concise. Keep your request direct, simple and to the point. The less wordy, the better. Three, provide a compelling request. Once you make a request for change, you're actually in negotiations. After communicating the issue, provide the person with a suggested solution that you and them will be happy with. Four, be curious. Listen to what the other person needs. Once you make a request, be curious about the other person's issues and objectives and make sure that you fulfill their request. It's not all about you. Five, be compassionate. Make an attempt to understand the other person. Listen carefully to their feedback and put your own assumptions aside. When a person feels like they're being heard, they tend to open up more and feel safer and more secure in the conversation, which leads to a more trusting relationship. Effective communication is one of the most important skills to develop. It's beneficial not only in the workplace, but also in virtually every aspect of your life. It's important to understand that communication is what builds bridges and connects people in a powerful way. When you're able to get your point across in an objective manner, others are more likely to open up, see your perspective and negotiate with you. Communication is the key to influencing others and creating powerful teams, relationships and joint forces to achieve successful outcomes. Hello everyone, my name is Rex Nessum. I'm a real estate advisor with Angle and Vocals, formerly prestigious properties, and I'm an elder at Community Fellowship Center, Assemblies of God, uh, where Pastor Bradley Hanfield is the pastor. I have been asked to speak for five to 10 minutes on the importance and the benefits of writing down your vision. Have you ever had a great idea? Ever woken up to have something on your mind you knew was great, but because you were either sleepy or so busy, you didn't have time to write it down? But did you have it happen with that when you did try to write it down later that day, it seemed that that thought or vision disappeared. Thoughts can change things when they are implemented. One of the first steps you should do is write it down as soon as possible. Don't wait until later. I don't know how many times I began my day with what I thought was an incredible idea or, or vision, but never wrote it down. If it's not written down, it does not come to pass. If it's not written down, we can't make blueprints or see what it can become. Writing the vision down starts beginning, uh, bringing it to life. 
there are two Bible verses that shows the importance of having a vision and writing it down that I would like to share. The first one is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tablets, that he may run that readeth it. The first thing we see is writing the vision is an act of obedience. The word of the Lord in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 instructs us to write the vision. Writing the vision is obedience to what God has asked us to do. The simple act of doing what the word of God says shifts us from being a passive laid back hearer to an active engaged doer. Acting on God's instruction puts us in a position to receive his best. Secondly, writing brings clarity. Writing also brings a sense of clarity to our thoughts and clarity is important. It's important because it provides focus. Instead of wandering aimlessly, writing allows us to zero in on our heart's desire. Putting pen to paper brings our desire center stage. Once focus is achieved, it is much easier to make plans in order to bring the desire to pass. Moving the idea from your mind to paper creates a physical representation of what it is to come. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablets that he may run that readeth it. Another benefit of writing the vision is that he who reads it may run with it. It doesn't matter whether the vision is for you as an individual, a family, a business, or a ministry, it's the same. Once you write the vision on the tablet and make it plain, whoever comes behind can run with that vision. Take for an example, you have a vision of a house. It starts with a concept in your mind. As you write it down, it becomes more plain. Three bedrooms, two and a half bath, living, dining, etc. The goal is to finish in 12 months from concept to turnkey. The architects puts it on a blueprint. From that blueprint, everyone who reads it can run with it. The engineer who lays the foundation, the plumber who lays the pipe and put in the plumbing fixtures, the electrician, the carpenter, etc. Everyone who reads the blueprint knows exactly how to follow that vision or that plan. The other scripture is found in Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The NIV puts it this way. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraints. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, if we were to take that same example of the blueprint with the plans that are drawn for the house, we can see how not having a vision, how dangerous that could be. I've been in real estate for about 27 years now, and I can tell you, I've been in some some houses and you can tell that these house these houses did not have a proper plan the plan does not flow um, some of the bedrooms you have to enter through another bedroom so you can see without a plan there can be chaos notwithstanding the scripture does not talk about house plan or the kind of vision that is spoken of in Habakkuk chapter 2. 
This speak of revelation of God, where there is no revelation of God, where there is no revealed knowledge of God, the people perish or the people cast off restraint. Which means that where people don't have an understanding of God, who ha does not have a vision of God, who does not know who God is and what is required of us by Him, they live all kinds of lives. They do whatever seems good to them. But those of us who, who have the vision of God, which is written down in Scripture, which we call the Bible, the Old and New Testament, we understand what God requires of us because He made it plain in the Scripture. So we don't run around aimlessly. We live our lives according to the Word of God. You know, many people say this, quote the Scripture, my life is ordered by the Lord. And this scripture is true, but I can tell you, unless you are living according to the word of God, your life is not ordered by God. You're out of order. Uh, my advice is make a vision, whether it's for you as an individual, a family, a business, or a ministry, write it down. Make it plain on the tablets so that he who comes behind can run with it. God bless you. One of the keys to success is choosing the right people for your team. Whether it's working on a project or you're pursuing a personal goal, or even if you're recruiting new members to your team, it is very ideal to ensure that those persons match the idea of what you're looking for for your business, as well as complement your own vision and values that you have for your organization. I will also mention, let's say, effective communication and collaboration. Those are also key factors that you would want to consider when choosing the right persons to be a part of your organization because it also adds a diverse mix of uh, background that you may be looking for, diverse opportunities to grow your business and seek all, all of the ideas that you're looking for to grow. And so I believe that when you're choosing the right team, that it's important for you to find people that match those values and visions that you have. And by having those qualities within your organization, you will win the day. Thank you. You have to believe, but sometimes do you. My name is Lyndon Gardner, and I'm here to talk about the importance of belief. People would tell you that to achieve your goals, you must believe in yourself. That is absolutely true. Without faith in oneself, you have no impetus to get started. But experience has taught me the opposite is also true. That's right. Sometimes it's equally important not to believe. If you don't believe that something is an obstacle, you don't need to overcome it. And it's also true that it's important to know who to believe in. I've always believed as a child that I would learn to fly and become a pilot. I believed I could do it, and I did not believe that it was impossible just because I did not have any money for flight school or to buy a plane. I worked hard because my mother said that working hard was the only true path to success. And I did believe her because she was that living example before me. After starting the airline and it became well established, I decided I wanted to build an FBO, the first of its kind in the Turks and Caicos. For building something on that scale, I needed a bank loan for it. But every bank I approached turned me down for what I believe was excuses, but principally in my own mind, because I was not able to persuade them to see the potential that I saw. I didn't believe that I should stop pursuing that dream just because other people did not believe in it. I worked on my presentation and got much better at describing 
what I could see in my mind on paper. With each denial and update, my presentation got better and eventually I met a new bank manager who listened, saw what I had seen and got my loan. In fact, he told me that he believed that even I did not see the full potential of what I could. And he predicted far more success than I expected at the time. He was right. I believe that if you want to achieve any goals, you must do something about creating the change you wish to see. As someone who traveled frequently, I was frustrated by the inability of Caribbean people to travel across our region without having to backtrack to Atlanta, Miami, and in some cases, New York. Why should I go to America to go to Jamaica? I believe that the people of the Turks and Caicos were able to visit their relatives in the Bahamas, go to university in Barbados, or pursue business interests and opportunities anywhere across the region they see an opportunity without having to spend dollars and days in transit because we don't have our own regional network. I believe it needed to be fixed and that's what I've been doing for the past 31 years. With each new route, we offer better or faster regional connectivity. I've actually doubled the size of the airline during the first stages of the pandemic, even though people told me that I should not and could not expand when the whole world was on shutdown. But I believe it was perfect time. I saw the glass half full instead of seeing it half empty. Because even in the pandemic, there was all these islands that still needed air services. And so I went ahead. It paid off. And today, because of that belief and action on it, I don't have to persuade people to let me fly to any country. Many reach out and ask for their cities to be onto the Inter-Caribbean route map. They believe we can because we are already doing so in 28 cities in 18 countries. Today, I'm further expanding our network so that persons can travel around the Caribbean more directly and more affordably, but also so that young Turks and Caicos Islanders, as well as brothers and sisters in the wider Caribbean, can have more career opportunities than I did. As we grow, we're going to need more pilots, more flight attendants, more mechanics, more finance people, ground personnel, customer service specialists, administrators, and I believe that each of you are perfectly capable of performing any of these jobs if you purpose yourself to it. Believe in yourself, in your own success, believe what your mother tells you, and do not believe that anything is impossible to you. My hope is that you believe in me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Honorable E.J. Saunders. I am the Minister of Finance, Investment and Trade and the Deputy Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands. And the reason why having financial capital is important to business is first and foremost, you need it to, for your startup cost. Uh, in order to start a business, you need to pay for a number of things. Uh, at the minimum, equipment. You may be able to have to hire skill sets. And having access to capital allows you to be able to bring on those things without having to wait in order to uh, go through that financing. It also helps with cash flow management. Because when you, after you start your business, you will have operational costs. This will have, you have to pay your rents, you have to pay your utilities, and all those other things. And having the cash on hand will help you to be able to get through your day very easily, get through your month without having, having any problems. Then there is uh, growth and expansion. If you want to grow, a lot of times when you start your business, it's not generating enough cash to the point where you can expand very quickly. But you might have a hot product where there's the demand, the demand is coming in quicker than your ability to expand the business from the cash flow that you're generating. So having access to easy cash uh, will allow you to, and cheap cash will allow you to grow and expand. You can also use your cash as a competitive advantage. There's sometimes during the, a downturn where people are, and businesses within a certain sector will do badly. 
and if you have cash on your hand, you can, uh, you can expand during the slow times, keep your staff on hand uh, and while the other businesses are floundering, or even maybe even purchase your competitor. It's been done a few times before. And if you are doing very well and you want to lead the industry, you could start to create the future with your cash by using it towards the research and development. A lot of big companies, Apple is one who came, and Steve Jobs, who was CEO of Apple, famously said that during a recession, he expanded, he spent more money on research and development. So coming out of the recession, this company, in this case Apple, will be better positioned to take the number one spot. I always try to take my cues uh, with, with that. So the businesses that I've been involved in, where during a downturn, I always expanded my, uh, my spending on buying up cheap real estate and in terms of being able to secure leases, rental leases for um, our office spaces or our retail stores. So coming out of the recession, we were well placed and we would have a cheap lease even after the ball came out of the recession. But we'll also be able to retain our talent or hire new talent at a discount. And, and in some cases, we were able to acquire our competitors. So all of those, for those are the reasons, I encourage you to as much as possible that when you can, save for a rainy day, particularly if you're going to go into business. Thank you. Rise up, take your position. A very successful book. Drex, I just want to congratulate you on your second book, Succeeding in Your Position, and I wish you all the best and look forward to selling the next book at the Pentecost Bookstore. Congratulations.